I'm going to say uh, a few words of introduction about Pastor Paul Whitmer, and then we'll do our prayer for illumination and our centering him, and then we'll hear from him. But Pastor Paul is one of the pastors that serves at Women at the Well United Methodist Church, which is a United Methodist Church within the Women's Correctional Institution in Mitchellville, Iowa. Um, they, Pastor Paul is ordained in the United Church of Christ and has served as a pastor for more than 30 years in rural and suburban settings, including a new church start in the 90s here in Iowa. All of this is in the newsletter, so I'm just skimming through. I was interested to read that he has experience teaching contemplative practices, leading retreats, and working with folks in the 12-step recovery, and that he is a trained spiritual director. He's been with Women at the Well, congregation um, since 2016 and as of July 1st 2021 he's been serving as the lead pastor of the prison congregation so we are so grateful for his presence here with us and look forward to hearing more about um, women at the well and about the bible and about him and and all the wonderful things that he'll bring in a little bit and now I want to invite us to center ourselves by joining together in the prayer for illumination the words will be available on the screen please pray with me May these words illumine the living word Jesus in our minds. May we behold him and be changed by the beholding, transformed into his image and his disciples. Amen. I invite you I'm really glad to be with you today and thank you for having me. Uh, I got to spend the day yesterday with Lynette Planbeck and told her I was going to be here and that gave her a moment to gush over Broadway United Methodist Church and uh, I agree I, I will gush over you as well you guys are a rock star church and uh, we're grateful for your partnership with women at the well enough gushing <laughs> scripture first Samuel 16 this is the anointing uh, of King David by Samuel <clears throat> I want you to listen for heart in this story. See if you can find heart. Your heart, the heart, the heart of David. The Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have found my next king among his sons. How can I do that, Samuel asked. When Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. <laughs> Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say, I have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will make clear to you what you should do. You will anoint for me the person I point out to you. Samuel did what the Lord instructed when he came to Bethlehem, the city elders came to meet him. They were shaking with fear. Do you come in peace, they asked. Yes, Samuel answered, I've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now make yourselves holy then. Come with me to the sacrifice. Samuel made Jesse and his sons holy and invited them to the sacrifice as well. When they arrived, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, Ah, that must be the Lord's anointed right in front of me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Have no regard for his appearance or stature, because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. Next, Jesse called for Abinadab, who presented himself to Samuel, but he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. So Jesse presented Shema, but Samuel said, No, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hasn't picked any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Is that all of your boys? Well, they're still the youngest one, Jesse answered, but he's out keeping the sheep. Send for him, Samuel told Jesse, because he can't proceed. We can't proceed until he gets here. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was reddish brown and beautiful eyes and was good looking. I thought we weren't looking at all that stuff, by the way. Anyway, the Lord said, that's the one. Go anoint him. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him right there in front of his brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. Then Samuel left and went to Ramah. Here ends the reading, Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's a heart thing. <clears throat> Say that with me. It's a heart thing. All right. Because if nothing else, you leave church today, that's, what, that's one thing I want you to have with you. It's a heart thing. Uh, my heart is full today with gratitude for, for Broadway United Methodist Church. And uh, I want to just begin with a sort of a snapshot update about women at the well. Uh, and then we'll get into this heart thing even more in depth. Uh, by the way, I think it was, this was one of my last preaching visits before the pandemic. I was here in, it was either January or February of 2020. Uh, right after I was here, I went on renewal leave and then the world shut down <laughs> with, with, with COVID. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I'll mention that. But let me start with, with a 15-year anniversary, which Women at the Well was begun 15 years ago in February. So uh, we, we have great plans to celebrate our 15-year anniversary this year. Uh, it was 15 years ago that Arnett Pint was appointed to go inside the prison and at least begin the work in July of 2006. Uh, to get women together and just kind of dream about what it would be like to have a church inside the prison. Uh, this was done in response, by the way. Bishop Palmer, I don't know if any of you remember that name, but he was the bishop in Iowa, and he challenged the Iowa Conference to think about Matthew 25 in particular. I don't know if you know that passage, but if I say a little bit of it, I think you'll recognize. Uh, you know, it's like, when, Lord, did we see you uh, hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? And he says, whenever you did this to the least of these. And so Bishop Palmer had the Iowa Conference sort of do an evaluation of Matthew 25 ministry. And it looked like they were doing a really good job of feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. But when it came to visiting those in prison, they found a uh, lack. Uh, maybe their heart, maybe it was a heart thing that they thought their hearts were stirred and maybe to do some ministry. And so they began to explore what it would be like to have a prison ministry at the women's prison in Mitchellville. And so in February of 2007, the bishop was inside the prison, gathered with about 100 people in the sacred place. Have any of you been visited women at the well inside? I wasn't sure if you have. So you have, okay. <clears throat> It was a wonderful service, and that Women at the Well was consecrated as a United Methodist congregation of the Iowa Conference right there inside the prison. So 15 years of, of ministry, uh, both behind and beyond bars. And I've already mentioned, so COVID changed everything. Did COVID change anything around here for you guys? Man, what a headache. Uh, we've been, we're still locked out. We've been locked out since March of 2020. I, w I will say this about being locked out. <clears throat> they locked us out in order to keep COVID out. Uh, and in that, they have been actually very successful. Uh, the women's prison in Mitchellville probably is, has done the best job in Iowa. And, and I would even say nationwide. You probably saw headlines and stories. When, when, when COVID got inside a prison, it would just run rampant, right? I mean, it's a locked, closed community. So uh, by keeping us out, and when I say us, I mean all volunteer programming. So AA, NA, uh, all religious services, anything that was driven by volunteers has been locked out since 2020. So the bad news is we're locked out. The good news is COVID was kept out. So the numbers in the prison have been very low as far as infection rates and, and whatnot. So we do celebrate that. <clears throat> But we're also ready to move on. And I am told by the warden that religious volunteer programming will be the first uh, in the list of volunteer programmings to be readmitted. And she actually thinks it should be happening now. The Department of Corrections is still working on changing some protocols. So I expect that by summer, hopefully, uh, we will be back inside. So our ministry behind bars has, has been to offer worship and pastoral care and leadership development inside the women's prison. Our vision, by the way, I love this. We have a mission, right? It's probably not unlike yours, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Our vision is to lead the church in love that breaks down walls. 
I find that inspiring, that, that a bunch of women inside the prison th- have the audacity to think they can lead the church. Are, can you buy that, by the way? Uh, I can, because I've been led. They have taught me things about hospitality, about generosity, about forgiveness, seeking and offering forgiveness. These women are leading the church, by the way, in love that breaks down walls. That, too, is a heart thing, by the way. Uh, some of our work happens beyond walls, and I want to say a min- uh, just a word about that. We have a reentry ministry, that, and, and Broadway has been uh, very good in that. Uh, so a woman leaves prison and comes back to Council Bluffs, let's say, and there's a reentry team that would walk with her, uh, church people that would just be with her, to pray with her, be a moral support, be a, uh, offer faith formation, some goal setting, just with basic life skills that sometimes are challenging for people. So uh, this reentry ministry happens every everywhere across the state and, uh, you know, where we have United Methodist Churches and other, other denominations, by the way, are part of uh, this ministry. Women at the Well is United Methodist in name, but ecumenical in spirit, as you can imagine. Uh, inside a prison, uh, it, it's best to be ecumenical and to reach as many people as you can. Uh, <clears throat> so that's sort of a snapshot update of Women at the Well. Uh, and yeah, join us in praying. By the way, I do have these offering envelopes. They're not as, as crafty as a, a pet rock, prayer rock or whatever, but, but I would invite you to take one of these, not just to put money in it, um, but take one home and, and put it in a place where it will remind you to pray specifically for women at the well. We would love and, and value your support and your prayers uh, without which we really can't do this ministry. So let's get to this scripture, and I have some other scripture I want to allude to, by the way. But this this anointing of David interests me on a lot of levels. One is, what's it like to pick a winner? Anybody here think you're good at at picking winners? (laughs) This is not a March Madness question, by the way, but it could be. That's, a, that's pain, a painful reminder. If anyone thinks you're good at picking winners, I just want to say you're probably either lying <laughs> or you're just terribly mistaken and don't know it yet. We're really bad at picking winners. I know I am. Uh, pastor Lee and I, Pastor Lee was the pastor that was serving when I came to Women at the Wall, and we used to just marvel at this. We would, we would look at a woman uh, who comes to us for help, and, we th- and we'd, we'd put her up with a, a reentry team, and sometimes we'd shake our heads like, oh, that's going to end terribly. And she would do amazing. And then we'd pick this other woman, and we'd think, well, sh- well uh, she's going to do really well. She's got her stuff together. And, and the next thing we know, she's off uh, on a drug rampage and, 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 and has OD'd before we know it. And it's like, wow, we're horrible at picking winners. Because with God, it's a heart thing. And sometimes we're just, we're just not in tune at that heart level. So I remind you, it's a heart thing. Right? Maybe you've heard people say it's a God thing. <clears throat> Maybe less frequently you've heard people say it's a heart thing. But when, you, when we say it's a God thing, often it's a heart thing. And sometimes when we say it's a heart thing, it is a God thing as well. Because like, like in this story with the anointing of uh, King David, God looks into the heart. While we're busy, you know, being obsessed with the, the outside and the things we think are going to be great, God zeroes in on the heart. <clears throat> I want to read a, a, an email I got. Uh, when I was new to the reentry part of this job, I came on in 2016. I took on the reentry ministry in 2018. <clears throat> and... Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. So I really relied heavily on people who were out in the field doing this work, sort of boots on the ground. And there's a woman, Deb Streff, you may know that name. She's very active in the United Methodist Women uh, in the Iowa Conference. And Deb, one of our rock star reentry people, she sent me this email. It was just an update, very, very quick update, about three women which she was working with. And when I read this email, I immediately thought about the parable of the sower. I'm not going to read that for you. I might put some pieces in there as I read this, but you'll see why, why the parable of the sower. You know where, Jesus, where the sower goes out and sows seed, and some falls on rocks and gets eaten up, and some falls among thorns and gets choked out, but some falls on fertile ground, right? 
So here's an email. I've changed these names, by the way, but these are real people. <clears throat> Number one, Deb says, I called Chris multiple times. I met her once. She has not answered any phone calls. I left a message that if at any time she wants to make a contact, she can. She didn't. A sower went out to sow her seed, and as she sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Number two, Deb tells me about Tracy. Tracy worked with us for about six months. Got out of Macaulay Center, lost a job for talking back. That always makes me chuckle, because don't you know there's a story behind that? She lost... I've never lost a job yet for talking back, but I do a lot of talking back every Sunday, by the way. Uh, it was somewhat questionable, according to another uh, woman that lived there, but she got another job. Macaulay made her quit her job because she wasn't attending classes as assigned. She still didn't attend. Pause. Let me pause right there. Does this sound complicated to anyone? <laughs> This sounds complicated to me. I mean, she's in a work release, so part of being in a work release is you have to work. You have to have a job. And you, there are certain rules. She's living under supervision, so she has to follow certain rules of the house. And apparently, within her parole agreement, she has to take a class. Maybe it's a life skills class. Maybe it's, an, maybe it's anger management so you don't talk back to your boss. I don't know. So <clears throat> there's all these pieces, and when one piece falls, the whole thing tends to collapse. Uh, as it does for Tracy. She lost her job because she wasn't going to the class, and now that she's not having a job, uh, she can't stay at Macaulay House, so she gets kicked out. <clears throat> she was warned and then kicked out. She's staying with someone and doing painting jobs in Davenport, right? She was released to Cedar Rapids, now she's in Davenport, and by the way, when it says she's living with someone, probably a guy, and you say that like it's a bad thing, Paul. Well, it probably is not a good thing. We'll just put it that way, right? So the whole thing just sort of collapses. One little piece, and the whole thing falls. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Six months, Tracy. Number three, Amy. <clears throat> Deb's email here, I printed it exactly as it was. It's in all caps now. Do you ever get an all caps message? It's exciting, right? She's like, yay! Amy is doing well at work. She's becoming a team leader. She's getting a raise. She's living at Macaulay Center, seeing her children regularly. That's a huge deal, by the way, right? Reconnecting with your kids and, and being able to see them. Uh, she calls us her church chicks and has never missed a meeting. Pause. How awesome is that, that this woman leaving prison has a group she calls church chicks? I just, that's a heart thing right there for me, right? My heart just gets a little bigger when I hear that. I mean, here's a woman leaving prison. She's probably never had positive relationships in her life, people who will affirm her, who will challenge her in healthy and helpful ways. These are her, church, these are her people, her church chicks. She's never missed a meeting. She's motivated, goal-oriented. We have all become good friends. We gab like old friends, loving every minute of our time together. She's met my family. She's involved with them. She's attended church once. Just once? She's working till 3 a.m. <laughs> okay, that helps. Uh, anybody working till 3 a.m., you get a pass on 8.30 church, I think, right? She's working till eight or 3 a.m. since she has become a team leader. Long hours, stressful job, but she is so proud of herself and happy. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. And as he said this, he called out, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Church, are we listening? Do you hear what's going on? Uh, life-changing ministry happens because we're out there sowing these seeds <clears throat> uh, and creating these opportunities. I gotta tell you, 
I was in Sheraton last week. I shared this very story, uh, and the whole all caps thing, and some guy comes up to me after worship. He says, that all caps story was amazing. Bring more of those. We want to hear more of that. And I'm like, dude, I do too, but you know what? That's not how it works. For every all caps success story, there's at least two that don't make it that far. There's at least two. <clears throat> In the parable of the sower, there's actually, it's, it's, it's 25%, right? There's four different examples of different seed, you know, spots. And only one of them is fertile and successful. This parable, by the way, is not about uh, inviting us to be uh, productive and effective in how we plant seeds, right? It's not t he's not telling this story so that we only plant, go find fertile ground and don't waste your time with all this other place. Just plant in fertile ground and then you'll, ha you'll have these results, right? That's not how this works. We don't get to just pick the success story and go with it. We just spread the seed. And here's where it's a heart thing again. When Jesus goes on to sort of unpack the parable for his disciples, he says something like this, the fertile soil is like those who hold it fast in an honest and good heart. And they bear fruit with patient endurance. It's a heart thing, in other words, right? It's a God thing. Those who hold it fast in an honest and good heart. And I have to pause here again and think about, well, I, I think about all the women that we work with. And I think we're all born with, with an honest and good heart. 98% of the women who are in prison, by the way, 98%. I'm not real strong in math, but that's almost all of them. They are survivors of trauma, sexual assault, violence at home, growing up as a kid or, or with a partner, 98%. So a heart that gets trampled on like that early in life and often throughout it, it something happens to that heart. <clears throat> and it's going to be very difficult for it to, to receive the soil or, and, and the word that is sown. But we, So we just have to sow the seed, right? We just have to keep it up. And, and and not really be focused on the results. You know, <clears throat> Samuel goes to, to anoint David King, and, and he's really concerned about results, as if it's up to him, right? Like, what am I going to do? He's fearful about he's, he, he's going to kill me if he finds out I'm there, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot about his focus on results instead of just being faithful. That sounds a little bit like Mother Teresa, who says, you know, God doesn't call us to be successful. God calls us to be faithful. There's another guy that does reentry ministry that I've learned a lot from. It's Father Greg Boyle. He works in Los Angeles. He's mostly working with, with gang members uh, in the L.A. area. And so they're not just leaving prison, but they're trying to leave gang life. And it's very challenging. When he fails, <clears throat> when he experiences failure in his work, there's usually a funeral involved. I've read his book, Tattoos on the Heart, and, and he talks in there, I think he did 27 funerals in the course of a year. 27 funerals, because uh, this young man is leaving prison, he's coming back, he's gotten a, a legitimate job, but the gang wants nothing of that. So this guy gets gunned down on his doorstep going home from a legitimate job. And, and how do you get up every day and do that kind of work, knowing that those are the odds? and that there's 27 funerals in a year with the guys that you're working with. So, you know, when we have failure, it's just, you know, somebody's gone back to prison or they've gone back to a toxic relationship and, and we mourn and lament that, but man, we're not doing funerals every day. <clears throat> Here's what Greg Boyle says about this work. If we're only focused on results, we'll only work with people who give us good ones. <laughs> Think about that. If we're only focused on results, we will only work with people who give us good ones. Uh, I've got to be honest with you, in the, in the, in the prison population that we work with, uh, there aren't a lot of prospects for good results there. There's a lot of prospects for headaches and heartaches 
and failures and stumblings along the way of relapse along the road of recovery. It's very challenging. So here's my sort of my recruiting pitch. It's not very good, but listen to it anyway. If you like the idea of getting up every day and banging your head against a wall, I've got a ministry for you. If you're uh, looking for a heart thing, if, if you want to pour your heart into someone's life only to watch them trample on it on their way out the door back into an abusive relationship, then I've got a job for you. If you don't mind showing up and just doing the work and leaving the results up to God, that, that's the bottom line right there, right? Then I've got a job for you. <clears throat> This reentry ministry, this work of women at the well, both behind and beyond bars, it, it's definitely a heart thing. And I invite you to open your heart to that possibility, uh, knowing that the results are not up to us, right? But we do them anyway. We show up. We do the work. We even put our hearts into it and are willing to have our hearts broken over and over again. Mary Oliver says, She's a poet, one of my favorites. She says, there are things we can't reach, but you can reach out to them, and all day long. There are things we can't reach. There are women in the prison that we can't reach, but we reach out to them, and we do it all day long. And we hope to bear fruit with patient endurance, we hope to have our hearts be uh, holding fast with truth and honesty. Thanks be to God. Amen.